What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to a new audiobook mini series. Well, I, I don't know why I call it a mini series. It's Somnophobia. We are reading through the first story in Somnophobia, which of course is Somnophobia. Now, let me just say a few things before we begin this. First of all, for all of, of you new subscribers, because my channel's kind of been blowing up lately. Um, there are going to still be video essays, obviously. This is just an additional thing that I always used to do. It's make audiobooks for the FNAF books so that they are more accessible to people who, you know, don't want to spend loads on FNAF books and have to read by themselves and stuff. So, yeah. We're going to be reading through some of the phobia. Uh, other thing is, obviously, this is very different to how I used to do it, where I put the words on the screen. Now, I am not going to be doing that. I know it's unfortunate, but it's due to copyright reasons, of course. So um, I'm not going to be doing that. It's just going to be a picture of something on the screen. I don't even know what it's going to be. So Somnophobia came out today as I'm recording this. Hopefully I can get this out today. But uh, I don't know. It might take a little bit longer because I now have a full-time job. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, let's just get straight into this because I don't want to keep blab blabbing on. Yeah. Is blabbing even a word? I don't know. Anyway, if you've got your copy of some of the phobia, then get it out and uh, you can read with me. Anyway, it's just terrible, Bill. All these people gawking at the poor family's belongings. Bill eyed his wife. You mean like we are? Oh, hush, Mildred scolded, staring at the display of home items set on several tables at the yard sale. If it gave her, if it gave her something to share at her weekly pin, pin oh, it's P I O. <laughs> Oh god, this is going to be way harder when you can't see the word. P-I-N-O-C-H-L-E. Pinnacle. Pinnacle. I'm going to say Pinnacle. Pinnacle game. So be it. We're concerned neighbours, Bill. Maybe we can take something off their hands so they're able to move on as soon as they can. It's just a shame about Josh, sweet boy. Bill scratched his jaw. Can't say I remember him much. Well, he was an odd one. Quiet. Kept, kept mostly to himself, and, and now he's suddenly in a coma, in need of full-time care. She glanced around and added in a loud whisper. So sad that his parents have to move out the state to get help from their family. No rhyme or reason for said coma? She picked up a mixing bowl. One day, he just wouldn't wake up. Doctors called it a medical mystery. Mildred fell to chill and set the bowl back down. The household items suddenly seemed sad and lonely to her. Maybe we can donate to help out. Bill picked up a broken sphere with an odd-looking character inside. He assumed it was one of those funny court gestures, wearing a cap and fluffy pants. With a frown, Bill set the ball down. I think it's a donation. Sorry, I think a donation would be best, Millie. Let's go home now. Ooh, <laughs> what a what a prologue. Rod, what scares you the most? Cliffs, dude, Rod said. Or ledges on tall buildings. I get the chills, like I might fall over the side. And clowns, definitely. Such a cliche, I know. But I saw some creepy movies as a kid. Sam Barker listened as he sat with Rod, Jules, Larry and Bogart in the bleachers at lunch on Friday. It was the spot for seniors to hang out. Sam and his friends had been waiting three years to get to this level of the hierarchy. Freshman year, they'd been in the cafeteria. Sophomore year, they sat in the courtyard. Junior year, they ate in front of the school on the steps. And now, finally, they were on the bleachers. The only downside, in Sam's opinion, was that the football field attracted the most sunshine. The sky was clear today, and it was a good thing Sam had applied sunscreen twice before lunch. But as, a but as a drip of sweat slid down his forehead, he realised he was going to need to apply a third coat soon in order to not boil like a lobster. With his blonde hair and fair skin, he probably should be wearing a hat at lunch from now on just to be safe. He pushed his vintage black-rimmed glasses up his nose and carefully unwrapped his sandwich as he listened to Rad talk about his fears. Yesterday, the lunch topic had been the best films of all time. Oh, Rod continued, and those amusement rides that make you drop from way up high. I feel like my guts get left behind. So not good. I love those rides, Bogart announced, and then took a massive bite of his pepperoni pizza slice. 
Bogart was the most talkative one of the group. He was also the guy who always wore shorts. There hadn't been a day in high school that his calves were covered, even when it was just freezing outside. Jules stood against the side railing as he snacked from a chip bag. He didn't sit uh, often and was usually on the move. Larry chomped on the hamburger and fries that his mom had dropped off for him before lunch. The guys always teased him that his mom still brought him lunch during senior year. Sam had stopped telling him how much trans fat was in those meals when Larry had finally said, bro. Larry was a guy of very few words. His hair was long and frizzy. Sam didn't think he owned a comb. Rod leaned back on his elbows and had his legs stretched out and crossed in front of him. He wore his clothes two sizes too big, but managed to look stylish in them somehow. His white tennis shoes were always clean and bright. Sam wasn't sure how he'd managed that. He wore his dark hair overgrown, so that the ends nearly reached his shoulders. Of course, Rod wasn't eating. He usually skipped lunch, no matter how many times Sam told him about the benefits of three meals a day. Sam was actually surprised his friend was afraid of anything at all. Rod was so easygoing. That was probably why he was able to remain friends with Sam, since everything bothered Sam. Rod had never seemed to, to pay any mind to his pal's cautious way of life. If Rod hadn't accepted him for who he was since elementary school, Sam felt he likely would have drifted away from the group. Jules, Bogart, and sometimes Larry just didn't fully get him. Sam studied his sandwich. Organic turkey, no dairy, on gluten-free bread, with mustard and fresh organic lettuce, tomato, and pickles. He'd made it himself. No way would he eat from the school cafeteria. Who knew how many hands had touched the food prep? How many people were breathing on it? Not only that, but their school district hadn't yet conformed to organic ingredients or no preservatives in their meals. Sam had researched his upset stomach issues last year and realised gluten, heavy oils and preservatives didn't sit well with his digestion. His frequent anxiety gave him a nervous stomach. He also had to steer clear of caffeine and sugar on his anxiety shot into overdrive and he couldn't calm down or sleep through the night. He was on a clean, dairy-free, gluten-free, stimulant-free health plan for the time being. He'd started packing his own meals so he wouldn't have to keep explaining that to his mum. Talk about scary. Did you guys hear that Josh's family is moving away with him? Bogart asked. Oh, Josh from the, from the prologue. Yeah. Yeah, bummer all round, Rad said and cleared his throat. What about you, Sam? What are the top things you're most afraid of? The world? Jules muttered under his breath. Bogart snorted. Sam ignored the comment as he carefully chewed a bite of sandwich before speaking. I'd say small, confined spaces, definitely the extreme dark, and large bodies of water. You mean like the ocean? Bogart asked. Sam nodded. Yeah, I never learned to swim. Your dad never taught you? Raz looked at Bogart and Bogart adjusted his hat. Um, I mean, it's okay, Sam said. Everyone knew Sam had lost his dad in third grade. No, he never taught me. I can teach you, Sam, Raj told him. Sam shook his head. No thanks. Besides, it's healthy to have fears. Before the moment could get more awkward, Jules interrupted. So, are we going to Misty's party, or what? When it came to deciding what the group was going to do, it was always we. If possible, the group hardly did anything without everyone involved. Yeah, I'm in, Rad announced. Something to do. Then everyone else decided to go too, although Sam would rather have stayed home. Parties had stopped being fun sophomore year when everyone stopped playing party games and started worrying what everyone looked like. But he was part of the group, so he was going anyway. Rad's birthday was Sunday though, and he'd chosen to hang out at Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizza Plex to celebrate with the guys. Sam was pretty sure that was going to be more fun than Misty's Salazar party. Sam walked behind the guys as they entered Misty's house. He wore a freshly ironed collared shirt and bl dark blue jeans. He always ironed out the wrinkles in his clothes or he felt uncomfortable wearing them. His hair was buzzed short so he never had to style it and his glasses were freshly polished to a vibrant shine. The music was loud and there were a ton of kids. Sam didn't especially like big parties. 
large parties were attended by the loud kids, the social kids, and often the popular kids, the entire opposite of Sam and his group. Misty lived in a huge two-story home with a large backyard and swimming pool. That was where most of the partygoers hung out. As Sam followed the guys into the backyard, he made sure to keep a safe distance from the pool. Of course, there wasn't a lifeguard in sight. With so many kids there, all kinds of accidents could happen. He shuddered just thinking about the possibilities. He settled at a table by the fence, positioning himself as far away from the enclosed water as possible, but the scent of chlorine still filled his nostrils. His friends meandered around, talking to other kids. Sam was fine sitting alone. He didn't really talk to other classmates, unless it involved school, and mainly just hung out with his small group of friends. He wasn't the best at small talk anyway, and he was used to other kids ignoring him or not really being interested in what he had to say. Sam accepted that he was somewhat of an odd one out in high school. He didn't do sports, he, joined, he didn't join clubs, he had a specialised diet and he only wore certain cotton fabrics because polyester made him break out. He was set in his ways and he rarely tried new things. He admittedly considered everything that could go wrong before he decided to do something instead of thinking of all the ways it could go right. But his way of living made him feel comfortable, so he accepted that about himself. It was just that others rarely did. Well, besides Rad. Surprisingly, a girl named Lydia Gomez uh, walked over to Sam's table. She had curly brown hair, freckles and a nose piercing. She wore jeans and a colourful sweatshirt. She didn't wear a lot of makeup like some of the girls at Marina High and she was always nice when Sam had study group with her in English Lit. She held two red cups in her hands. Hi Sam, I always wanted to tell you that your glasses are pretty cool. They're so unique. Thanks. Um, they were my dad's. He adjusted them on his face, even though he didn't need to. It was a nervous habit. When I needed glasses, my mum put my prescription in them. That's really neat. Do you want a drink? She offered him a cup. Sam eyed the drink suspiciously. What is it? Well, I'm told it's Misty's birthday poolside punch. Do you know what's in it? Lydia frowned at the cups. Definitely some kind of fruity stuff. Sam looked around and noticed kids acting silly and talking funny. He held up a hand like a crossing guard. No thanks, Lydia. If there's even a chance of alcohol being in it, then I'm not having it. I'm a firm believer in staying in control of my mind and my choices. She gave him a smile. You sure? A couple sips won't hurt. He adjusted his glasses again. Actually, that's far from true. Sam, just take the drink. Sheesh. Jules was abruptly at the table and grabbed the drink out of Lydia's hands, um, slamming it down in front of Sam. Don't mind him. Sam's a glass half empty kind of guy. Sam had been about to explain how alcohol could cause someone to become drowsy and in less control. Instead, Sam cleared his throat. I make smart and careful decisions in order to navigate around future challenges. Jules rolled his eyes. Right. The rest of the group walked over to the small table. What's going on, guys? Rad raised an eyebrow. Just Sam being Sam. Jules left it at that and took a big swig from his red cup. So, have you guys heard about the cliff diving going on in Santa Cruz? Lydia asked. I hear it's pretty fun. Yeah, a guy I know does it. Bogart jumped in. Says it's extreme rush. You gotta love the heights though. Guess that leaves you out, Rod. No doubt, Rod said. One day I'd like to try it, Lydia said. Sam shook his head. People have actually broken their necks and other body parts from reckless jumps off cliffs and bridges. Not long ago, there was an incident on the news about a guy that did a cliff dive. The cliff was so high up that he couldn't control where he landed. He ended up falling on a bunch of rocks, breaking every single one of his bones and splitting open his skull. They said his brain was eaten by the birds when they found him. Dude, that's gnarly. <laughs> oh God, that was... Wow. Uh, true story. I'd definitely steer clear of that activity, Lydia. Sam warmed. Warmed? Warned. Um, okay. Lydia said, and looked around the backyard. Oh, I see my friend. Talk to you guys later. Then she took off rather quickly. Good one, Sam. Jules blurted at Lydia rushed away. J sorry, Jules blurted as Lydia rushed away. Real smooth. What do you mean? You really impressed Lydia with your death talk. 
She should be impressed. Making safe choices in order to have a secure and long lifespan is a plus. Jules made her sound like a buzzer. More like a negative with your doom and gloom attitude. Sam frowned. I don't have a negative attitude. No? Why wouldn't you take the drink? I don't like to be uninhibited. Whatever that means. Why are you sitting so far from the pool? You know I can't swim. Are you aware of how many accidents happen in home pools? What's the leading cause of death in the US? Well, that's easy. Heart disease. Jules threw his arms up, spilling some of uh, his drink on the ground. I rest my case. You're a walking encyclopedia for doom and gloom. All right, Jules. Rod cut in. Chill. He patted Sam on the back. No worries, Sam. It's all good. Let's all just relax and have some fun. Sam nodded his head, even though Jules was making him feel bad. Maybe high school girls didn't understand Sam, but at least he had one good friend who did. Jules must have not liked what Rod said, or maybe he had too much to drink, because he took the cup Lydia had brought for Sam and shoved it in Sam's face. Here, Sam. Some of this will help you relax. Sam attempted to block Jules' hand, but the drink splashed into Sam's mouth and down his shirt anyway. Sam quickly stood and pushed Jules away. The cup fell into the ground, spilling the liquid into a small puddle. He tasted the artificial sourness of the drink, spat it out on the ground, then swiped at his mouth with the back of his hand. Jules and Bogart laughed. Oh shoot, Bogart muttered with a hand over his mouth. You've really done it this time, Jules. Sam blinked rapidly. The disgusting taste of the mouth, oops, the disgusting taste of the drink lingered in his mouth and he didn't know what was in it. He didn't like the taste. He didn't like to be taken out of his comfort zone. And sometimes he just didn't like Jules. Jules, not cool, Rod said. You okay, Sam? No. No! Sam shook his head as he stalked into the house, searching for water to get the bad taste out of his mouth and to clean his shirt. His breaths became uneven and he knew his anxiety had kicked in. There was a pressure building in the centre of his chest. His hands started to clench and unclench as he pushed through kids, trying to get to the kitchen. He opened the fridge and found a water bottle, quickly opening it to drink some and swish it around in his mouth before spitting it into the sink. He could feel kids staring at him, but he didn't care. He just needed to calm down and regain control. He pulled off the paper towel from the roll and poured some water on it, then dabbed at his shirt. The drink had stained it a weird blue colour. It was likely ruined. Sam started to sweat and he couldn't stop blinking. His entire body felt stiff with tension. He needed to change. His shirt was dirty and wet. He felt like the party, the kids, were closing in on him. He wanted out, needed out. He tossed the paper towel, stumped through the party, and exited through the front door. The long walk home and the cool air against his face would calm him down. It usually did. Sam went home, Rod, Bogart told him. Saw him leave out the front door. Rod nodded. Even though he hadn't been the one to upset Sam, he felt bad for what went down. He felt bad for Sam a lot. He probably just needed some time to cool off. What's the big deal? Jules asked. It was just a joke. I joke with people all the time. You don't see anyone else throwing temper tantrums. It wasn't that funny, Jules. Especially to Sam. Jules snorted. Why does he have to act all weird? He's always so uptight with his don't do this, don't do that attitude. The guy needs to loosen up. He's already, he's always spending, sorry, <laughs> he's always spreading his potential doom around. I get tired of it. You too, right, Bogart? Larry? Bogart shrugged and looked down at the ground. I don't know. Larry shook his head. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jules muttered, giving them both an irritated look. Raj shrugged a shoulder. Sam's different. We're all different in our own ways. No one's perfect. You've got to accept people for who they are, Jules. I accept you, don't I? When Jules didn't say anything, Rod just said, Let's bail. He was no longer in a partying mood. On the day of Rod's birthday, the Mega Pizzaplex was packed. There were long lines for Monty's Gator Golf, Roxy's Raceway and Fazza Blast, but the guys had waited them out and got their playtime in. Glamrock Freddy and Roxanne Wolf walked around the mall area greeting children, Sam could hear mechanical sounds as the characters moved, and he wondered if they were uh, if there were people inside of the costumes, or if they really were animatronics. The scents of pizza, popcorn, and cotton candy filled the air. 
Sam figured they piped those smells through the air to get more sales. And sure enough, every other kid held a fluffy ball of cotton candy and a bag of greasy popcorn. Sam tried not to shudder. Chatter filled every inch of the space. People were talking. Kids were yelling and parents were scolding. Someone laughed really loud. Music played from all directions. It was sensory o overload. And not just the sounds. Neon lights uh, glowed throughout the entertainment mall, giving the place a futuristic feel. Visiting the mega pizza plex felt like being inside a video game. <laughs> That's such a funny line. Oh, that is such a good line. Visiting the mega pizza plex felt like being inside a video game. That's like quite literally <laughs> under construction, if you if you don't know, um, is all inside a simulation. I'm telling you guys, Rod said to them as he guided them through the crowd toward the Fazcade prize shop. All I want is one of Moondrop's dream spheres. If we put all our winning tickets together, I bet we can get one. It would be a cool birthday gift. Oh yeah, by the way, Moondrop. I just said Moondrop. The, the character in this in the story is called Moondrop. That's really cool. He pointed to the boxed ball on the shelf. What is it exactly? Jules asked, eyeing the packaged sphere. Um, Sam hadn't spoken to Jules since the incident at Misty Salazar's party, and Jules had given him some space. They'd been through these incidents in the past, and if they ignored them, things would slowly go back to normal. However, Sam knew nothing was ever truly resolved between them. It would likely all happen again until Sam stood up to Jules. Since Sam tried to avoid all confrontation, the cycle would likely continue. It helps you study, Rad told them. It lights the room up and helps you slip into a hypnotic state in order to focus better. It supposedly takes information from your subconscious and brings it more clearly into view. You guys gotta help me. If I don't pass physics, I'll be stuck in summer school. Sam eyed the box. The dream sphere appeared to be a snow globe with Moondrop the Jester inside. Half the character's face was a pale crescent moon. The other half was eclipsed in darkness. He wore a cap and puffy blue pants decorated in stars and a grey top with a frilly collar. Bells hung from his hat, both wrists and tips of his shoes. It's a thousand tickets, Sam said. We have to jump for ticket. No, I'm joking. Uh, how, much do, how much do we have saved up? 790, Bogart answered. The guys always pulled their tickets, and Bogart was the official ticket holder. They'd figured they would eventually save up enough tickets altogether to get a really cool prize they might all be able to use. Sam was determined to get the Dream Sphere for Rod, since he was such a good friend. And hey, Sam had a big test coming up, so maybe he'd give it a try if it was safe. For the next hour, the guys all played the high-ticket arcade games. Sam liked to play games where the lights spun around in a big circle of numbers, and you had to hit the button to try to get the biggest ticket prize. He landed on some 10s, 22, and then 40. A handful of tickets later, he topped off the ticket wins by scoring a 100-ticket jackpot. Way to go, Sam! Rod praised. That was pure luck, Jules muttered. All right, Bogart said once he collected Sam's tickets. I think that puts us up the mark. Let's go get this dream sphere. The guys went to the prize area to wait in line. While they waited, Jules and Bogart poked fun at some of the adults and kids. Oh, dude, look at that shirt on that guy. It's like two sizes too small, Bogart said. His big belly's hanging out. Jules, Bogart and Larry all snickered. But Sam and Rod didn't care for what for that form of entertainment. When it was finally their turn at the counter, the girl at the prize register took all their tickets from the backpack and dumped them into a bucket to be counted by the machine. 1001. What do you guys want? She asked them. The moon drops dream sphere for the birthday boy, please, Bogart told her. The guys all laughed at that part for some reason. The girl grabbed the boxed sphere and handed it over to Rad. Have fun she said with a smile, and tossed her hair over her shoulder. The girls always tended to gravitate toward Rod. And happy birthday. Thanks, he said with a smile. The dream sphere was in blue and black packaging with neon letters spelling out Moondrop's dream sphere. Up close, Sam could see Moondrop had an odd grin and a pointy nose. Rod was pleased. All right. Thanks, guys. This is so cool. 
Let's head to my house and take this thing for a test run. The Dawson's house was pretty roomy now that two of Rod's siblings were away at college, but it still felt full of family. Rod had a cousin who was never far from his mother, his grandparents stayed over on the weekends, and he had a string of aunts, uncles and cousins that visited often. Sometimes Sam wondered what it felt like to belong to such a huge family. Sam was an only child, just like his parents. His only grandparents lived out of the state. Since his dad died, it was just mom and Sam for holidays and special occasions. Although, since his mom was an art teacher, he always had a school event to attend to or volunteer for. Sam had spent most of his teen years helping out at carnivals, dances and fundraisers. Rod's parents had left a note that they were out buying his cake. As the guys settled in the living room, Sam read aloud the fine print on the Dreamsphere box. Warning, only use, uh, sorry, warning, only use Moondrop's Dreamsphere for 10 minutes a day, Sam frowned. I wonder why. Dunno, but that's what we'll do, Rod told him. You can time it for us. Get your study notes, guys, and prepare to be hypnotized. Now Sam understood why Rod had asked them to bring their notebooks to his house before heading to the Mega Pizzaplex. Rod took the box from Sam and removed the sphere. The sphere was set on a black platform with a button to turn it off and on. Rod plugged in the device and set it on the coffee table. Brutus, Rod's dog, wagged its tail as he waddled into the room. He was a big brown catahoula mix with a spiked red collar because Rod's mum thought it looked cute. If a dog named Brutus could ever really be referred to as cute. Rod knelt down and rubbed the dog's big head as a thick line of drool hung from Brutus's wide mouth. How you doing, boy? Brutus began to happily lick Rod's face. Sam adjusted his glasses. My dad told me this story once when I was little. He had a good friend in college. They went to parties and all that. One night the guy got pretty smashed and he fell asleep on his friend's couch. They had a dog. That morning he woke up and the dog had eaten his face off. Ooh, bro, that's sick. Rod frowned, looking a little disturbed. He patted his dog's head before pu pushing Brutus back. That's enough for you, big boy. Sam nodded matter-of-factedly. True story, so I'm wary of dogs. You want to know what I'm wary of? Bogart asked. Guinea pigs. My cousin Howie had one. He liked to feed him carrots. One day, he looks away for a second. Chomp. The guinea pig... Sorry, the guinea pig bites off the tip of his pinky, thinking it was a baby carrot. All right, guys, Rod said with a shake of his head. Let's get back to the dream sphere, please. Sitting on the couch, Larry studied the sphere. This dream sphere isn't going to really work, is it? You're starting to sound like Sam, Jules said in an annoying tone. Or in an annoyed tone. Truth, Bogart said. I'll try about anything that helps me get out of real studying. Are we sure this is safe? Sam asked Rod. Come on, Sam. What could go wrong with a spinning globe with light? Seizures. But only in some people with epilepsy. Otherwise, I guess not much. Oh, that's pretty rich coming from Captain Doom and Gloom, Jules said. Sam felt the room tense. It was a little too early to go back to teasing when the party incident was still fresh. Let's try it, Rod said, breaking the silence. I'll even put Brutus outside so he can't eat our faces off while we're hypnotised. Bogart snorted and Larry smiled. Putting Brutus outside was smart thinking, Sam thought. Okay then, let me set my watch alarm for ten minutes. Hey, Brutus, where's your toy? Brutus looked around the room and grabbed a big chewed up rope and brought it to Rod. He certainly likes to chew on things, Sam observed. Time to play outside, boy, Rod told Brutus and took him out the room. When Rod came back, the guys were all seated on the couches and chairs around the coffee table, notebooks open on their laps. Let's do this, Moondrop, Bogart yelled. Make me smarter! If that's even physically possible, Jules said with a smirk. Only time will tell. Alright, ready guys? Here we go. Rod pushed the on button and Sam started the timer on his watch. The lights glowed out of the dream sphere, shining on the walls and ceiling. Moondrop turned in a circle, waving his hands. The jester's eyes, the jester's, the jester's eyes glowed red. Shining lights flashed across everyone's faces. At first, Sam didn't feel any different. The lights were just annoying and made him blink. 
But in the next moment, a light-headed feeling came over him. He lifted his hands and he moved slowly, as if the air was heavy and thick like syrup. He was aware of his friends, but they seemed far away, as if the room had stretched really wide. Do you guys feel that? Bogart murmured. So cool, Jules said. Whoa, Larry said. Words began to float off the notebooks and into the air around them. Guys, Rad said in awe. Look at that. The notes transformed from words and numbers into pictures that surrounded them. The ceiling faded away and was replaced by, by a blue sky and a bright shining sun. They were standing on sand dunes with the pyramids of Giza nearby. The sun beat down on them and the heat was scorching. It's hot here, someone said. Look at the structure of the pyramids. Hey, this is for my world history notes. Sam could no longer tell who, he, who was speaking. The words might have even come from him. It was as if their voices had all become deeply monotone. Wow, it's like lucid dreaming. This is unbelievable. Dude, I'm like seriously in Egypt. The pyramids faded away and a huge aeroplane was taking off on a runway. The guys ducked as the plane lifted over their heads. They were in awe as the harsh sound of the plane vibrated above them. The kinematic equation involving the airplane's distance before takeoff drifted across their eyes. The room turned into a warm restaurant kitchen with stainless steel countertops and a large brick oven. A cook took a pepperoni pizza out of the oven. Sam could smell the pepperoni as the cook began to cut the pizza into fractions. Can I eat that pizza? I'm hungry again. Yum. A girl in a renaissance era dress stood on a balcony shouting, Oh, Romeo, Romeo. <laughs> oh, man, who brought their English, English literature? I didn't bring my Romeo and Juliet notes. I think it's picking up on stuff we learnt in class. This is getting trippy. Sam's wristwatch began to beep with a distant echo. You guys hear that? Time to shut off the dream sphere. Suddenly, the lights on the sphere shut off. Moondrop went still, and the guys sat for a moment in the unexpected quiet. They stared at one another, and then Rod said, That was the coolest thing I've ever experienced. The group started laughing together. I can't believe it worked, Bogart said. It felt like I was literally in another world. That was awesome, said Jules. I remember everything. The facts, the equations. It's like I'm experiencing a photographic memory right now. Cool, said Larry. <laughs> I feel really good, Sam added in awe. Like... I could learn anything and everything in a matter of minutes. I'm surprised that this worked. Amazed, actually. This is the best birthday present, guys, Rod said. Thanks. I am so passing my classes this year. We have to do this every week. I'll even share the wealth. One of us can take it home for a week, and then someone else the next week. This is too fantastic to keep all to myself. Sam's hand went straight up before anyone else could say anything. I'll take it first. He was almost surprised at how fast he volunteered. But there was something really exciting about the dream sphere. It made him feel something he hadn't felt in years. He wasn't sure if it was excitement or eagerness or even something freeing about it. He just knew he wanted to do it again. I guess Sam wants the dream sphere super bad, Bogart said with a laugh. Figures, Jules muttered. Bogart adjusted his hat. All I know is that after seeing the pizza guy... I could eat more pizza. In fact, I could win a pizza eating contest. Binge eating isn't safe, Sam told him. I once read a, I once read about a kid who was in a hot dog eating contest. He ate so many in 20 minutes that he suffocated. When they opened him up, his stomach and intestines were packed so tight with the links that the hot dogs had slipped into the airways. It took literally days to get all the hot dogs out. Jules rolled his eyes. Sick, Larry said. I love how Larry just says one word. <laughs> Sam, you need to lay off the crazy stories, Bogart suggested. Anyways, Rod unplugged the dream sphere and handed it to Sam. The sphere's all yours, bud. We'll trade next week. Sam took the sphere and smiled. This week was going to be awesome. Then he realised something strange. He could have sworn the sphere vibrated in his hands, ever so slightly. Ho ho, ho ho, ooh. <laughs> right. Sam heard rock music blaring from his mum's bedroom. Mum was painting again. Sam, you home? He heard her call out. Yeah, mum, I'm home. He yelled back. I bought you food from Rad's party. He set the foil-covered plate on the breakfast bar. 
Sam and his mom lived in a two-bedroom, one-bathroom apartment. The bedrooms and living area were large, and with just the two of them, it was a comfortable home. Mom's art brought colour to the space. The walls were bright blue and covered in her vibrant paintings. The living room couch was a rustic orange layered with a cosy blanket and fancy pillows. There were a few family pictures on the television stand with dad, mom and him. The kitchen had a mini breakfast bar off the counter and a small island in the centre of the kitchen area. The music cut off and his mom strolled in from her bedroom. Her blonde hair was bundled on top of her head. She had blue paint on her cheek and she wore a paint splattered smock. She was wiping her hands with a colourful stained rag. How was Rad's party? she asked. Was it totally Rad? <laughs> Mom, when are you going to stop saying Rad's name like that? Oh, I'd say in about a hundred years, when it finally gets old. It's way past its expiration date. Hmm, well I made cupcakes. Want one? Sam lifted his eyebrows. Are they gluten-free with an unprocessed sweetener? They are not gluten-free and they are made with absolutely delicious processed sugar and chocolate. He shook his head. No thanks, I'll pass. Guess I'll be sharing them in the teacher's lounge. Mom, you knew I wouldn't have any. I dream of the day when you'll wake up and smell the sugar. Sam placed the dream sphere on the breakfast bar next to the plate. His mum walked over to the sphere. And what is that thing? It's a dream sphere. It helps you study. We want it the Mega Pizzaplex for a rod, and we're taking turns using it. His mum picked up the sphere and shifted it into her hands, watching Moondrop turn left and right. He's a weird looking guy. Helps you study. Huh? How about helps you to kick crazy diets and encourages you to eat pizza, cake and candy like a normal teenager? Mom, my digestion is 50% better on my new meal plan and I'm more energised, if you haven't noticed. It's the new me. Mom made a show of staring at his face. Nope, still the same old kiddo to me. Handsome as ever though. Sure, Mom. Sam shook his head. But he was used to his mom's jokes. She was one of the strongest people he'd ever met. She'd somehow worked through the grief of losing her high school sweetheart and helped Sam through grieving over his father at such a young age while still managing to help them survive. His dad had been the breadwinner in the family while his mum took care of him and followed her dream of being a full-time artist. Her paintings hadn't really taken off, but her passion never faded, even when she had to go back to work as a middle school art teacher. She had to squeeze in moments to paint for herself nowadays, Sam didn't feel so bad hanging out with his friends when his mum was alone. It gave her a chance to paint. Thanks for bringing me the food, mum said. Smells yummy. There's birthday cake too. Double the sugar and gluten for me. Even better. The next day after school, Sam set up Moondrop's dream sphere in his room. His mum always stayed a little longer at her school to get things prepared for the following day, and he had some time to himself. He placed the dream sphere on the bedside table and plugged the cord into a nearby wall outlet. Like the living room, his mom made sure his bedroom was scented with colour. His walls were forest green, with light wooden furnishings. She had bought him light brown bedding with highlights of dark blue and green. His tall bookshelf was lined with some of his favourite childhood books and a few toys that his dad had brought him. He also had a ton of books on digestion, health, germs and making smart choices. His favourite picture of him and his dad sat on the top shelf. They were sitting on his dad's motorcycle, probably about to go on one of their father and son rides. Sam, uh, Sam sat up on, on his bed and picked up a two-subject notebook with school notes on English literature and ocean science. He set his wristwatch alarm for 10 minutes. He decided to take off his glasses and set them on the little table, and then he pushed the button to start the dream sphere. Moondrop turned, and the lights flashed across Sam's face. After a moment, he began to feel that slow, heavy feeling sink over his body. It felt so surreal that he wondered what would happen if he stood up, but he didn't want a chance falling over and hurting himself. Words floated out of the notebook, dancing before him, and then fading into the air. First, he appeared right in the middle of Hamlet. The costumes were straight out of a historical text. Uh, what, what's the... What's the what's, um, to be or not to be? That is the question. Uh... <laughs> That's not in the story, but yeah. Uh, the words from his performance, the words from the performance were spoken naturally. He felt as if he, he was witnessing William Shakespeare's imagination at play right in his mind. Sam went to adjust his glasses and remembered he took them off. Then, he, then it dawned on him. He actually could see very clearly without wearing his glasses while using the dream sphere. 
That's cool, he murmured. He was thrust into the ocean, and before Sam could panic, he realised he could actually walk and breathe underwater. He floated down to the ocean floor and glided across the sand and rock careful not to step on any crawling sea creatures. Man's in creative mode. <laughs> he sensed the coldness of the water, but it wasn't overwhelming. A school of fish scattered away as a pod of humpback whales swam close by, singing a song. Though even in a dream state, his mind specified that humpback whale songs were made up of groans, grunts, and whistles most of the time. Seahorses floated past him. A sea turtle slowly swam below the whales. Then the whales swam by Sam and the most peaceful thing, uh, feeling, came over him. He reached out a hand and touched one of the whales. He could have sworn the eye of the whale actually looked at him. The songs of the whales seemed to glide through the ripples of water. Suddenly his wristwatch sounded, and a sense of loss overcame Sam as he pulled back from the lucid experience. It was an odd shift from dream reality into the present. He pushed the button on the dream sphere to turn it off and clicked off his alarm. But as he adapted once again to the surroundings of his bedroom, a smile spread across his face. That was fantastic, he yelled out. Sam jumped up and did a little dance as he looked at himself in the mirror. He could admit it was odd to see such a full smile on his face. It really transformed him. He hardly ever smiled. And for once he could admit that he looked and felt happy. He even flexed his arms and wondered if he should start lifting some weights. He did the cardio that was recommended to maintain a healthy lifestyle, but maybe he should add to it. He'd definitely think on that. Sam's stomach growled. He was so energised that he got the idea to treat his mum to a homemade dinner. He slipped his glasses back on and went to the kitchen to cook one of her favourite dishes. An hour later, when his mum came home, her eyes widened in surprise. Have I walked into the wrong apartment? Sam smiled. Nope, this is your home with your son, making your favourite gluten and processed cheese lasagna. Be still, my heart. Sam, what has brought this on? Sam knew it was the dream sphere, but I just felt good, and I wanted to show my appreciation for all the things you do for me, so I cooked you dinner, and I even had time to straighten up the apartment. Mum's mouth popped open. You cleaned the bathroom? Sam squinted at her. I'm not feeling that good. Of course not. Mum walked over and put her hand to his face. You don't seem warm. You sure you're feeling okay? Sam shrugged her hand off. Mom, stop. I feel fine. Just trying to do something nice. She smiled. Sam, thank you. I appreciate the gesture. This looks wonderful. Let me change and then we can eat. What are you going to have? He popped open the oven. I also have one gluten-free lasagna minus the cheese. She laughed. I'll be ready in five. <clears throat> I love the... Um, the... The way they talk to each other. I, I, I like their relationship a lot, Sam and his mother. It's a really nice touch to the story. I, I think it's very enjoyable. Uh, where is this story going, though? I, I actually know where it's going. I've read the leaks. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure you, are, you, are, you have some theories on where, where this story is going to go. And I must say, it is, it is mad. This story is, is crazy. So The next day, Sam eyed the dream sphere in his bedroom. While at school, he'd replayed his session from the day before over and over in his mind. It had felt surreal, and yet so real. It was like he travelled to other worlds right from the confines of his bedroom. He really wanted to extend the experience just a little bit longer. I bet it would be fine to go for, say, 15 minutes, he reasoned, adjusting his glasses. It's only, fi it's only five minutes more. Shouldn't really make a difference. I mean, what could it hurt? He didn't have any new notes from school to study, so he sat with his entire government book, which was pretty thick. He set his wristwatch to 15 minutes, removed his glasses, and with a push of the button, turned on the dream sphere. Moondrop began to turn, and the lights from the sphere flashed across Sam's face. The notes of the book floated through the air, and the branches of the government moved across his eyes. He witnessed the Declaration of Independence being signed followed by the historical timeline for voting rights. <laughs> I, 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 I like the, the, I like, I just like, oh, he watched the entirety of Hamilton. <laughs> uh, he watched George Washington take the oath to become the first president and was in awe viewing the parade of US presidents who followed as they were sworn into office. He witnessed treaties and laws being passed. He glimpsed wars being fought, which upset him. 
And then finally, it was as if the entire contents of the book had slipped into his mind like a human computer downloading a file. Whoa. He was starting to feel like some kind of genius with so much knowledge packed in his brain. He felt himself tremble from the intensity and the amount of information he had witnessed. Maybe, he considered, the entire government book was a little too much. In the next moment, the scene changed and he found himself at a small park. This is strange, he thought. Could this be part? Could this park be history? Oh my gosh, I'm so bad at reading. Could this park be part of the history in the book? His wristwatch began to beep that his time was up, but Sam waited a moment longer before clicking off the dream sphere. The park looks strangely familiar. It could be any park, really, with a sandbox slide, swing set, and seesaw. Tall trees were scattered around. It was a nice day with only a few clouds in the sky. Birds were chirping and other kids played in the sandbox and on the swings. But then he saw... Hey bud, let's play tag. You're it. Dad? Sam said, and the one word seemed to echo around him. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah, this park was part of history. Sam's history. Come on, catch me, his dad smiled. He was young and healthy, just like Sam remembered him. He had overgrown light brown hair, with some scruff on his face from not shaving for a few days. He wore faded jeans, black work boots, and a t-shirt. He was wearing his signature Ray-Bans. He waved Sam to come after him, and then Sam jogged toward him. But Sam was little, and his dad had always been faster. Dad, wait, you're too fast! Come on, catch me! That's the game! Then Sam lost him. He was gone. Sam looked around, a little nervous. Dad? Where are you? He spotted something blue and grey shift at the corner of his eye. Sam turned to see what it was, but he saw nothing but a few trees. Suddenly, his dad jumped out from behind a tree in front of him. Gotcha! You scared me! They both laughed really hard as his dad picked him up and swung him around in a big circle. Beep, 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 beep! Sam pulled himself back from the memory and hesitantly switched off the dream sphere and then his watch alarm. He was still laughing. Until he was crying. Oh my god, that's such... That's real... Oh my god, I didn't think that would be emotional in any way. Well, obviously it's emotional. But, um, that line really got me. I don't know why. It's, it's the short sentences of, um, he was still laughing. Until he was crying. Like, it turns... It shifts dark, like, really quickly. Anyway. He sat there in the quiet for a long time. Experiencing the lost memory over and over again in his mind. Sam was searching in the hall closet, digging through old boxes. It was their junk drawer, full of sentimental items as well as odd things they didn't always need but occasionally used, like superglue, masking tape, a screwdriver, a hammer, an old paint roller, and a wrench. He was pretty sure the wrench was his dad's and would never be used again in his lifetime. Sam, what are you looking for? Mom asked from behind him. Sam's nose itched from the dust, and he squeezed once, then again. Twice, three times for the gold, his mom announced dramatically. He rubbed his nose. I was just looking for some of Dad's things. Oh, what do you need? I don't know. I want to remember him. Sam pulled out a box of photo albums and old yearbooks, then shoved it back. There was a pause, and then Mom said, Grab that white box with the removable lid on the top shelf. Sam grabbed the box and brought it to the living room. Mama had her hands on her hips. What made you want to look at your father's stuff? Sam shrugged. I had a memory, and I thought it would be nice to remember some more. What was the memory? Sam's lips curved. We were at some park, playing tag. I could never catch him. Mum smiled back. Yeah, it would always tire you out, running around after your dad. Together they sat on the couch and lifted the lid. These were a few of your dad's things. She took out a wallet, faded and worn out on the edges, and the keys to his motorcycle, though the bike had been totaled in the accident. There was a favourite white shirt of his that had a hole in the collar, a few collectible coins, and some old pictures from when dad was a little kid. You looked like him when, you was, when he was younger, Sam's mom said. Sam could see the familial resemblance in the nose, shape of the face and the mouth. Wow. I never realised that I kind of looked like him. Oh my gosh, Michael Parallel. 
Uh, there were also a bunch of CDs with a portable CD player and headphones. Dad loved music like you do, Sam recalled. I forgot about that. Mom sighed. Yeah, I, I have most of the old CDs in my room, but here are some of his older ones that he liked as a teenager. Sam studied the CD cases. Lots of rock and roll bands and a few solo artists. He pulled out the CD player with headphones. Can I use this? Sure, honey. Take what you need. There are some new batteries in the drawer in the kitchen. Your dad would have liked you to listen to his old favourites. Sam took some of the CDs and put the, ba and put the box back in the closet. After he replaced the batteries in the player, he went to his room and shut the door. He put a CD into the portable player and slipped on the headphones as he lay down on his bed. Slow rock music played, and he closed his eyes, thinking of his dad. In government class, Sam was handed back his latest test. Excellent work, Sam, Mr. Taylor praised him. You're at the top of the grading curve now. I'm glad to see you're putting more effort into your studies. Sam nodded with a smile. Thanks, Mr. Taylor. He'd aced the test, and the extra credit questions with a total score of 115%. He usually scored in the 90s. So, he definitely upped his grade with the help of the Dream Sphere. Jules leaned toward him, from the desk next to him. When are you going to share the sphere? Sam adjusted the glasses. After the week's over, I've only had it a couple of days. You already aced the test. Now it's my turn. We made a plan, Jules. We've got to stick to it. Jules frowned. It's not like it's your sphere. Sam shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Talk to Rod. It was his idea, and it's his Dream Sphere. Jules sat back with a scowl, and Sam took a steady breath. He didn't realise his pulse was speeding up. He had a few more days with the sphere, and then one of the other guys would take it home. That was the plan, and it wasn't going to be a problem. Well, he didn't think it was going to be a problem. He was so caught up in thinking about the sphere that it took him a moment to realise he hadn't let Jules push him around. Rod caught up with Sam as he walked to the bleachers for lunch. How's it going with the dream sphere? Rod asked. Pretty good, Sam said slipping on the hat that he remembered to bring this week. I'm taking in a lot of notes. I aced my la latest government test. He didn't mention the memory of his dad. It was too private, too personal. And while Rod was his good friend, he felt more comfortable talking about his dad with his mom. That's cool. I'm glad it's working out for you. Hey, are you doing anything after school tomorrow? Don't think so. Why? My dad asked me to do some yard work and trim this old tree we have in the backyard. I could use some help if you're up for it. Sam nodded. Oh, sure. I'll be there. Thanks. With two of us, we'll get it done in no time. Rod hesitated. And look, Sam, I'm sorry Jules gave you a hard time at Misty's party. You have nothing to apologise about. It wasn't you. It was just Jules being Jules. You're both my friends, you know? Sam nodded. Yeah, I get it. The friends left it at that as they climbed up the bleachers to meet with the rest of the group. Sometimes Sam hung with the guys after school and joked around for half an hour, but today he went straight home. He was eager to use the dreams for her again. Eager to feel good. Eager to feel energised. Eager for a lucid experience. He grabbed an apple, washed it, and then took it to his bedroom. He had a few notes from one subject to use and, well, he wondered if another memory might pop up. A memory of his dad. He occasionally dreamed of his dad, but the dream always faded when he awoke. Sometimes he looked at pictures to remember him, but it wasn't the same as the vivid memory he'd experienced. It was. It had been like he was really re reliving that fun moment at the park when he was little. Back then, there hadn't been a care in the world. There'd been laughter, fun and joy. Feeling joyful and carefree wasn't really part of his life anymore, and that was kind of sad when he thought about it. It's not that he didn't love his mum, but with Dad gone, there was a hole in their family that never seemed to be filled. When he experienced the vivid memory, that hole had been briefly filled and overflowing. He wanted to experience it all again. He took a bite of his apple and set his watch to 15 minutes, then hesitated. When he'd last used the dream sphere, the lucid dream of his dad hadn't come until after the first 15 minutes of study time. Five minutes more hadn't seemed to hurt him. I'm sure ten minutes more would just be fine too, he said. There was a familiar voice in the back of his mind telling him it might not be such a good idea, but he squashed it. He can always be Captain Doom. Oh, that's such a good sentence right there. He might have a full five minutes of time with his dad in the dream state. When he'd went over a couple of minutes past 15, he felt fine. 
In fact, he felt fantastic each time he used the Dream Sphere, even better than being on his gluten-free meal plan. He took a breath and reset his watch alarm for 20 minutes. When he slipped on his glasses, or off his glasses, sorry, he pushed the Dream Sphere's on button. The light spun, the heavy feeling sunk into his body, and the study notes came alive. He experienced ocean science on a new level. He could feel that the oceans were very old, ancient, Billions of years of history could be, could be told through the oceans, but Sam hesitated to take in that much information. He had a sudden thought that his mind couldn't handle it at all. Uh, then the scene shifted. The apple had, he had been eating floated up into the air. It broke apart in sections of the stem, the core, the seeds, the inner pulp of the apple and the skin. The nutrients of the apple listed before his eyes, as well as the health benefits to the body. Wow, he said in awe. Looks like I need to eat more apples. Then the memories arrived. His mum and dad took him on a road trip to an amusement park. They rode fast rides, played games, and ate funnel cake. Dad won him a stuffed giraffe and let him sit on his shoulders as they walked through the swarm of people. He could see everything from that height. He thought he saw a funny hat with a bell hanging from the tip among the crowd and a, crown, and a, and a clown with fluffy red hair up ahead of them. He could feel the light brush of wind against his skin from that day. A seagull flew by him and landed on a nearby fence. Sam tried to grab it. The bird squawked and flew away. A trip to the zoo followed. Dad kneeled down next to Sam and they watched the gorillas stretch out in the sun. He could smell his dad's aftershave and felt the comfort of being with him. The smaller monkeys made Sam laugh as they swung from trees and picked at one another's hair. His dad tried to pick at his hair and they giggled together. There was a fun moment when they had a picnic at the beach. Mum and Dad helped him make sandcastles moulded with plastic buckets, but a wave washed them over. Sam was upset until his dad splashed him with cold seawater and a splash fight began. Sam could taste the salty air as if he was really there and feel the grainy sand on his skin. He relived family movie night. Sam sat on the couch, squeezed in between Mum and Dad with a big bowl of popcorn on his lap. His mouth watered with the taste of butter, and his skin warmed at the coziness of the room. He felt loved and secure, wedged in the middle of his parents. Those were some of the best memories of his life. It seemed Sam had forgotten all the wonderful times they'd had together, or perhaps he had them buried deep within his mind because remembering had hurt too much. His alarm sounded. Sam turned off the dream sphere with a soft smile on his face. He wasn't too sad this time. He was content to relive those memories again. He pulled out the CD player, slipped on the headphones, and lay back on his bed, listening to his dad's music. Then he replayed the memories he'd just experienced in his mind like his own personal home movie. Sometime later, he blinked when he heard his mom come into the apartment. His room had slightly darkened with the late afternoon. He sat up, pulled off the headphones, and rubbed at his eyes, trying to shake the drowsy feeling from his head. He looked, up, he looked at his watch. He'd been lying down, replaying the memories in his mind for over an hour and a half. He hadn't even realised how much time had passed. That evening, Sam found his mum in his room holding the dream sphere. A flash of irritation came over him. Mom, what are you doing? His voice was urgent and he tried to stop himself from snatching it away from her. Mum's eyes widened. Whoa, just checking out the funny ball. What's got you in a twist? He adjusted his glasses. Uh, nothing. I didn't know what you were doing. It's... It's Rod's. We have to be careful with it. Please, leave it alone. I know it's Rod's. Sheesh. Have you been using this every day? No, he fibbed, crossing his arms. But w when I do, it helps me to remember my school notes. Mum lifted her eyebrow. Hmm. I don't recall you every... I don't recall you... Sorry. There are, there are actually spelling mistakes in this. Like, there's quite a few which is unfortunate, but, you know, it is what it is. I don't recall you ever having trouble memorising your notes before. And you seem to be a little intense about this ball. Sam blinked. What? I'm not intense. She gave him the mum stare that he knew so well, a look that basically said, get real, just be careful with things like these, Sam. Pretty soon, you could be clucking like a chicken, and then what would we do? And I'm only half kidding. Sam sighed. Sure, mum. She finally set the spear down and left his room, closing the door behind her. Sam felt his heartbeat start to slow down. He sat on his bed and picked up the spear. Moondrop stared up at him with his red eyes. If she only knew how truly great you are. 
She wouldn't be giving me a hard time about you. He felt a strange vibration coming from the sphere again, and felt the urge to give the dream sphere another go, even though he'd already had a session that day. Maybe just a quick ten minutes, he thought. But when he heard his mum washing the dishes and singing along with the radio, he decided to wait until tomorrow. He might be too distracted with his mum at home. During the night, he tossed and turned. He could sense the sphere sitting beside him on the little table. He didn't look at it, but he knew it was there. The sheets felt itchy and warm. He kicked off a sheet and rolled to the side. Moondrop stared right at him. Oh, Moondrop stared right at him. For a split second, he thought the red eyes flashed bright. He blinked, and the light was gone. He was probably just half asleep, but he still felt that uncomfortable urge to turn on the dream sphere and to slip into that familiar lucid state. He reached out his hand to push the on button and again stopped himself. Sam blinked rapidly in irritation and his chest felt tight. He clicked on the table lamp and sat up in bed, picking up the dream sphere. His shoulders were stiff and his legs were restless. He couldn't relax, but with the sphere, he always felt calm. He really needed that right now. He shook his head. No, I can wait until tomorrow after school, when I'm home alone. He got up, unplugged the sphere, placed the globe in his closet and closed the door. Tomorrow, he murmured as his eyes drooped. He just needed some sleep. Sam went to school that day with a bad case of brain fog. He was irritable and he wasn't sure why. In class, he felt disconnected. He sat in government class and he was supposed to be taking notes, but he just stared at the whiteboard the whole time. He was aware of Mr. Taylor speaking to the class, but he couldn't focus on his words. Earth to Sam. Hello. Jules called to him. Sam blinked. Uh? Jules snapped his fingers in front of his nose. Wake up. Class is over, dude. The bell rang. Space out much? Oh. He looked around the classroom. The other kids were already up, heading out the door. What's the matter with you? Nothing. He got up and grabbed his backpack from the floor, and Jules, sorry, that was not a delay, uh, Jules accidentally bumped into him as he was walking by. Sam scowled. Watch where you're going. Jules turned and scowled back at him. You watch where you're going. Then he bumped in again intentionally as he left the class. Sam had to step back in order to not fall over. Jules had bumped him on purpose. Sam stormed to his locker to grab his lunch and slammed the metal door closed. Hi, Sam, he jumped. Lydia was standing next to him. He sighed. Oh, hi, hi, Lydia. Didn't see you there. Is everything okay? Sam had been adjusting his backpack, but now he looked at her suspiciously. Yeah? Why? Her eyes, sorry, her eyes widened and she took a step back. Um, you look a little upset is all. Sam shrugged. Just tired today. He wasn't upset. Was she okay? Her lips curved upward. Yeah, school can get tiring. Um, I was thinking. Yeah, well, he said, interrupting her. I gotta go. He walked away. Uh, oh, okay, bye. <laughs> That's one way to shut down a conversation. As Sam walked to the bleachers, he wondered why people were suddenly interested in how he was acting or feeling. Normally, people didn't even see him or care to talk to him. Now, when he wanted to be left alone, it was like people were all up in his business. He sat on a bleacher a row below Rod. How's it going, Sam? His friend asked him. Fine. But it wasn't going fine. Sitting in the sun, he realised he'd forgotten his hat and his sun cream. Um, he hadn't felt like making a sandwich that morning, so all he had was fruit. And it probably wouldn't fill him up. Today was turning out to be a total downer. You alright? You look a little tired. His shoulders went stiff. I said I'm fine. Rod lifted up a hand. All right, all right, cool. Sa uh, Jules butted in from his stance, leaning against the side railing. He was spaced out in government class too. I think the dream sphere is making him seriously wig out. I think it's time to pass it on to the next person who can handle it. Me. No, it's not making me do anything. I haven't even used it much, Sam said. I just didn't sleep well. As if, it, as if it's any of your business. You'll get a turn after the week is over. Now drop it. He turned to Rod. Every day he's on my case. Give me the sphere. Share the sphere. He hasn't had the sphere yet, and he's already wigging out about it. Bogart laughed, and Jules didn't like it. You're the one wigging out, Jules spat out. You're probably freaking obsessed with it. 
You probably use it all day, every day, like the dork that you are. I'm not a dork, Sam snapped back. You're the dork who can't wait his turn. Bogart snorted. Look at Sam being all grouchy. Does the spear make you grouchy? Maybe I should pass on my turn. I like being in a good mood. Sam's hands clenched into fists. I am not grouchy, Larry said. Denial. <laughs> Larry. I freak, L Larry is my favourite character in this. Sam stood. Just shut up. I don't even care if I use the sphere anymore or not. I'm not going to use it today either. Just to prove you wrong. Then hand it over, Jules said. It's at home, jerkwad. What did you call me? Jules stepped closer on the bleachers. You heard me. Let's all calm down, Rod said. Always the peacemaker. Take it easy, Sam. Everyone's just kidding round. Jules, relax, man. I think everyone's a little on edge today. Sam's eyes began to hurt again. If I'm on edge, it's because sometimes I don't feel like kidding around with you guys, okay? Sometimes I don't want to be the target for you to pick on or tell me what's wrong about me. Sometimes I just want to be left alone. He grabbed his lunch bag and stomped down the bleachers to do just that, to be alone. He could see some of the other seniors whispering about him as he stormed off. What? He snapped at a guy staring at him. Or it's more like, what? Or what? I don't, I don't know what that what is. That is. It's just what question mark. He snapped at a guy staring at him. The guy just rolled his eyes. Sam's shoulders were moving up and down with his breaths and he knew he needed to calm down. He found a small corner against the school building and slid to the ground. He was tired and yeah, he was grouchy, but he didn't need his friends telling him what he already knew. He took out a banana, peeled it and ate it. Then he took out his apple and bit into it. He closed his eyes and tried to calm down in order to stop the anxiety uh, clawing at his chest. I, he wished he had his dad's CD player, but he didn't. So he pictured himself sinking into a dream state with the sphere, where he was always calm and at peace, where no one could bother him or tell him he was acting the wrong way, where he was free from anxiety, where life was safe. The end of school couldn't have come fast enough. Sam turned off his phone and walked home. He didn't meet the guys in the parking lot. He still felt off, and he wasn't sure what the problem was. He couldn't totally blame the guys. They were the same, always cracking a joke at someone, often about Sam. But usually Sam brushed it off. Usually Sam avoided confrontation. Today, he couldn't seem to do that, maybe because of the lack of sleep or because he hadn't eaten enough. He stopped at a mini-mart and looked for something to eat, but everything was processed and loaded up with sugar and chemicals. He eyed an energy drink, uh, an energy drink, hesitated, then walked to the coffee machine instead. He needed a quick energy boost. He brought the coffee and drank it on the way home. He shuddered because it tasted bad, but the caffeine would hopefully snap him out of the brain fog. He walked by the neighbourhood shopping centre. Cars drove by on the busy street. A kid rolled next to him on a skateboard. He saw an ad for the Freddy's Mega Pizzaplex at a bus stop. He looked at Glamrock Freddy, Roxanne Wolf. Glamrock Chica and Montgomery Gator all together looking happy and cheerful. Now, um, I do just want to say right here. Um, wow, I've been talking for a while. Oh my gosh. Um, I do. I want to say right here that uh, I I make timeline videos. Basically, I, I make Tales from the Pizzaplex timeline videos right now, and I have already got one out for the entirety of the book Somnophobia. You can go and watch it on my channel right now. And uh, the timeline placement we have for this. It's very difficult because it, it doesn't have much to do with Security Breach, you know, like that there, there aren't many big events that happen in the Mega Pizzaplex. Um, a, a little bit like Frailty kind of, we don't really hear much about the, the Mega Pizzaplex or anything. But there is one detail here, and that is the fact that on this billboard that he is looking at, there is a Montgomery Gator. And that is very important because that means that this story takes place after Bonnie was was replaced with Montgomery. Do you know what I mean? So it's kind of in the later half, I would say, of, of the Mega Pizzaplex's opening. Uh, if it is the same Pizzaplex, anyway. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, but yeah. Ooh, he walked further and he saw snow globes in the window for sale. Then the next window had hanging bells. Everything reminded him of the dream sphere. Moondrop's dream sphere. 
He had wanted to use the sphere while he was at school. He wanted to use it right now. But he was trying to prove to his friends, to himself, that he could stop whenever he wanted. That he wasn't wigging out about it. That he wasn't obsessed. Yeah, he was irritable. But if he had another session with the sphere, he knew he'd feel better. The anxiety would be completely gone. The irritation would disappear. Isn't that all that mattered? Why should he deprive himself of happiness just because of what Jules thought? He didn't even have to know. Everyone had the right to feel good, to feel happy. Even Sam. And that was what he could do. Make himself happy. He finished off the bad coffee, tossed the cup in a garbage can, and then jogged the rest of the way home. He went straight to his room. He was breathing fast, and he licked his dry lips. He dropped his backpack and kicked off his shoes. He opened the closet and put the dream sphere back on his bedside table, where it belonged. He took off his glasses, set his watch to 20 minutes, and pushed the on button on the dream sphere. Moondrop spun. The lights flashed, and Sam felt his emotions level out as he slipped into a lucid dream. He was exactly where he wanted to be, or he was exactly where he was meant to be. When his alarm went off and he came out of the dream state, he felt relieved and calm. Although this time, he felt tired, pretty much nearing exhaustion. There was no energised feeling like when he first started using the sphere. He wasn't sure why. Was he using the dream sphere too much? He wondered. But then he disregarded that right, and, uh, that right away. Everything is just fine. He remembered to turn on his phone and a bunch of texts popped up. His eyes widened. Oh no. He'd forgotten that he was supposed to help Rod with his yard work. He squeezed his eyes shut. He hated disappointing people, especially Rod. He rubbed his head hard and then quickly texted him. I am so sorry I didn't feel well after school and went straight home to rest. I should have texted you and let you know. I can help you tomorrow, promise. Rod texted back. No worries, I got Jules to help me. Sam's shoulders sagged. Rod was his only good friend. He didn't want to mess things up with him. He got up since his mum would be home soon, but he felt like he could lay around for another hour or two. He went to his bedroom mirror and he blinked. He was paler than usual and he actually had some dark circles under his eyes. His hands were like were in fists, like he was ready to fight someone. And he deliberately unclenched them, rubbing his palms against his thighs. He had a passing thought that maybe it was a dream sphere that was making him exhausted. But then Rad's words came into his mind. Come on, Sam. What could go wrong with a spinning globe with lights? He heard his mom come through the door. He took a breath and pa pasted a smile on his face. But it felt unnatural, so he stopped trying to look happy and went out to meet her. The story's getting interesting. Conversation at dinner with mum had been nearly non-existent. Dinner was simple, soup and rice. Sam was tired and if mum was quiet, she was also tired. Mum got up to put her bowl and spoon in the sink. Sam followed and then turned to go into his room. Sam, it's your turn to do the dishes, she told him. Sam sighed as he turned to face her. I'm too tired tonight. Can you do them? She lifted an eyebrow. We made a deal a while ago to take turns and it's your turn. Can't you make an exception? No, I'm tired too. And I do the dishes when it's my turn, whenever I'm tired or not. Or whether I'm tired or not. And usually so do you. He waved a hand. Fine, I'll do them tomorrow after school. She sighed. Ah, oh, you know I don't like the kitchen to be a mess. That's not my problem, he snapped. That's it, Mum crossed her arms. What is going on with you? What do you mean? I mean, with the bad attitude. It's not like you. Usually you don't like the dirty dishes to sit because of bacteria buildup. That was true, but at the moment, he didn't really care. What's really going on, Sam? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't. Look at your shirt. Huh? Look down at your shirt. Sam looked down at his shirt and his eyes widened. What's wrong with this picture, Sam? His mum walked toward him and pinched the sleeve of his shirt. It's wrinkled. You never wear wrinkled clothes. You went to school like this? I forgot, he said quietly and pushed up his glasses. She stormed past him to his bedroom and raised an arm as if to showcase his room. Your bed is a mess. Your backpack is thrown on the floor along with your shoes. 
Your clothes have missed the laundry basket. And you never do that, Sam. Never. So, I'm going to ask you something, and I expect an honest answer. Are you doing something that you are not supposed to be doing? He stepped back. What? What? No, no, Mum, no. I'm, I'm not doing anything bad. I promise. Then, what's going on? Has something happened at school that I don't know about? Is this about a girl? He stomped, she stomped over to the dream sphere. Is it that thing? What the heck is it doing to you? An irrational wave of upset feelings overcame Sam. No, Mom. Just stop and leave me alone. No. Whatever is going on, I want it to stop. And I want this thing gone. Do you understand? Give it back to Rod. Sam raised his arms in exasperation. I will. Just don't worry about it. Stop getting on my case about every little thing. I am your mother, and I will worry about anything I want, because you are still a child, and it is my job to take care of your well-being. When you understand that, things will go a lot easier. His mom stormed out, and Sam went into his room, slamming the door on her and her outrageous accusations. He threw himself on the bed, tossed off his glasses, and growled into his pillow. He turned his head, and he was face to face with Moondrop. You get me don't you? Even though his mum was home, he set up wrist, his wrist alarm. Uh, sorry, he set his wrist alarm, pushed on the dream sphere and stared into the spinning lights. Mom, I'm going to stay home from school today. He'd had strange, uncomfortable dreams and he tossed and turned all night. He didn't understand why he couldn't sleep well anymore. It must have been the coffee yesterday from the mini mart. He had stopped drinking soda and coffee for a reason and now he remembered why. Mum walked to Sam and felt his head. What's the matter? You're not feeling good? He shrugged his shoulders. I didn't sleep well last night. I didn't have anything major going on at school. I'll email my teachers for today's classwork and make it up. Mum sighed. Look, I'm sorry about last night. We were both cranky and took it out on each other. It's been a long week. He nodded his head. I'm sorry too. I've got a lot on my mind. Honey, I know you've been missing Dad a lot right now. Sam's eyes burned. It's been hard lately. I know Sam. Um, I was very confused there because I thought I was Sam's mom speaking. Um, I know Sam. She blinked quickly a few times. A day off wouldn't hurt. Just take a break from the weird ball as well, okay? Sure, mum. It's video games and binging television all day for me. She smiled. Now, I know you're not feeling well, if you're agreeing with me. But when are you going to give the ball back to Rod? Soon. Which was true. And it made his chest feel a little tight just thinking about it. He crossed his arms against the awkward feeling. She kissed his cheek. Good. Take it easy and rest. A few minutes later, she left for work. Uh, Sam felt that familiar twinge of guilt for lying to his mother. But she just wouldn't understand. The dream sphere was a miracle. Yesterday, he had more lucid dreams with his dad, woven from more memories that he'd forgotten. It felt like he was making up for the years they'd lost. He needed this. He needed his worries, his anxieties to disappear. Sure, the energising part of the experience had completely disappeared, but that was okay. He could live with that. He went straight to the bedside table, where the dream sphere sat. He hadn't eaten breakfast, but he didn't feel hungry. His stomach wasn't growling, so he'd be okay until lunch. This time, after he took his glasses off, he lay down on his bed and got comfortable. He set his watch for 20 minutes. He turned to his side and gazed at the sphere from his bedside table. He pushed the on button and the lights flashed across his eyes. Moondrop began to spin, waving his hands. Sam dropped into the lucid dreaming state rather quickly. He was eight and riding on the motorcycle with his dad. The motor echoed around them. It was the last ride they'd taken together. They were on a road trip, just the two of them. The weather was warm and the leaves were turning yellow, falling on the road. Sam had felt a calmness that everything was alright. He was safe and protected with his dad. Dad pulled off to a rest stop with picnic tables and restrooms. Other families were sitting at the other tables. Mom had made them sandwiches and packed snacks and water. Dad set the goods out on the table for them to dig into. Sam? Dad, uh, dad started as they sat, eating their lunch. I'm glad we can have these rides together. Me too, Dad. You know... As you get older, I want you to experience things that are out of your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to try new things. Go on ex adventures with your friends. Explore the world. 
Discover what makes you happy and experience it as much as you can. Sam nodded with a mouthful of the sandwich. Okay, Dad. About that, I want you to remember to make good and responsible choices. Be a strong young man and do what's right. When you make a choice in life, there will always be repercussions, good or bad, depending on the actions you take. Uh Uh-huh. Dad smiled. You might not understand now, but hopefully you'll remember this conversation when you need to, when you're older. It will be important. You'll be there to remind me later, right? Dad chuckled. I'll remind you, son. Sam frowned as he relived the memory. He'd done the opposite of what his dad had wanted for him. He'd become a cautious kid that barely tried anything new or adventurous. It had all started when he lost his dad from the motorcycle accident. He'd known motorcycles weren't the safest form of transportation, but that, but hadn't thought anything bad could happen to him or dad. But it had, so he would tried to be careful from there on out. And whenever he felt out of his comfort zone, the anxiety kicked in. His dad had been his sense of safety. Without him, Sam had built himself a cocoon. He felt that if he'd made informed and cautious decisions, he'd be safe. But what he hadn't realised was that he was depriving himself of new experiences that could turn out okay. Experiences that could bring him some of the joy he'd lost when dad was gone. He didn't want to be a disappointment to his dad. He wanted to be a kid that dad could be proud of. He wanted to feel secure enough to take action and do fun things like go on spontaneous adventures with his friends. To ask a girl to prom, maybe. He felt he hadn't been a strong man, a strong young man who made good choices that his dad wanted him to be. Not when he was planning out each and every move in his life with the fear that something could go wrong or something bad could happen to him. The alarm on his wristwatch sounded. Beep, beep, beep. Sam tried to reach to click off the dream sphere, but it was as if he couldn't lift his arm from his bed. Hey, he thought. What's the matter with me? The memory shifted. He was back at their old house. He sat at the kitchen table eating cereal before going to school. The television was on in the living room. Dad was saying goodbye before he headed to work. See you later, buddy, he told Sam, and ruffled his hair with his hand. Sam nodded his head. Kay, love you, son. Sam was too enthralled in the TV to answer. In the distance, he heard the motorcycle rumble. No, Sam said, trying to pull himself out of the lucid dream. He didn't want to experience this memory again. The memory altered. Sam watched as his mum picked him up after elementary school to take him to the hospital. She was crying. It's your dad, Sam. There's been an accident. What's happened? Is dad going to be okay? Mum hadn't answered because she hadn't known the answer. Sam's chest felt tight and he was suddenly scared. More scared than he'd ever felt before. Stop! I, I don't want to see this! Sam shook his head, but he couldn't pull himself out of the lucid state. He could barely lift his arm, and it felt back to the bed. It was like his body was too exhausted to move. Finally, he swung his arm over just enough to turn off the sphere. He sat up and blinked and took a breath. Then Then his mom burst through the bedroom door. Sam jumped from his bed. Mom! Mom was disheveled and crying. But she she looked younger, still. It's your dad, Sam. There's been an accident. What? Sam's eyes widened. He jerked his head toward the dream sphere. Moondrop was still. And then the little gesture. Oh my god, I keep saying gesture. And then the little jester was slowly turning again as lights flashed from the sphere. Sam looked down at the bed and saw himself in a trance. What's going on? What's happening? He looked back at his mum and was stuck into a memory. Or sucked into a memory. I'm so sorry, I'm so bad at reading. This is, a, this is really creepy, by the way. What the hell? Um, he was back to his younger self, watching his mom pace the floor of the hospital. She kept wiping her fresh tears with a crushed tissue. The doctor walked into the room. Her eyes were tired. Mrs. Barker, there was nothing more we could do for your husband. I'm sorry for your loss. Mom had crumpled before his eyes, and Sam had started to cry for his dad. Stop! Let me wake up for real this time. With all of his strength, uh, Sam jerked himself up off the bed and slammed his hand down on the dream sphere's button to turn it off. He was breathing hard. A sheen of sweat had sprouted on his forehead. His hands were clenched into fists and he was trembling. He looked at his arms and opened his hands. Was he really awake this time? 
He rubbed his face. He felt awake. He stood up, but he was weak and off balance, so he sat back down. He held his head in his hands as it throbbed with an ache in the centre of his forehead. Both of his eyes stung. His mouth felt dry. He wasn't sure how long he dreamt, but it had been over the 20 minutes he had set his alarm. Something was definitely wrong, Sam realised. Since using the dream sphere, his sense of reality was blurring. He thought he'd awaken from the dream state when he really hadn't. It was like his control was slipping away. Not only that, but he was changing. He was breaking promises and skipping school. He'd been irritable with his friends and with his mum. He was lying to everyone. The urge to use the sphere was always there. When he was at school, when he was lying in bed at night, it was as if he couldn't stop using it, couldn't stop thinking about it. This isn't good. His dad warned him about making responsible choices, and it was time to start. He had to give the sphere back to Rad. Today. He forced himself up. He walked to his mirror, and he, he did a double take. His eyes were bright red in the outer corners. He moved closer to the mirror. Oh my gosh, he whispered as his pulse fluttered. There was blood in both of his eyes. He'd read about blood vessels, sometimes breaking in the eyes when strained or irritated. He paced back and forth for a moment as his chest tightened. What was he going to do? What would his mum say? Would she blame the sphere? It's okay, he murmured. My eyes will heal. I just have to get the sphere back to Rad. I have to get it back to normal. And then I'll figure something... Uh, I'll figure out something to tell mum so that she doesn't freak out. He took a breath and went to the kitchen to make himself a healthy, gluten-free, dairy-free chicken salad with fresh fruit. He wasn't hungry, but he forced himself to eat. And then he showered to wake himself up. He put some drops in his eyes, just in case it would help. He ironed his shirt and pants and got dressed, then grabbed the dream sphere and headed for Rod's house. It was time to let go of Moondrop's dream sphere for good. Sam knocked on the front door of Rod's house, but no one answered. He heard Brutus's deep bark and he knocked again. Sam tried the handle and the door opened. Oh, someone had forgotten to lock the door. Brutus came to the threshold. Woof, woof, woof. Sam held up a hand. It's okay, boy. It's just me. It's Sam. Brutus tilted his large head. He seemed to recognise Sam as he then turned and ran, or waddled off. Rod, you home? Sam called out as he walked in the house and closed the door. No answer. Hello? M Mrs. and Mrs. Mr. Dawson? It's just me, Sam. I came by to drop something off for Rod. Didn't seem like anyone was home. Sam glanced at his watch. The guys had just gotten out of class. It was too early. He took out his phone and dialed Rod. Hello? Hey Rod, I'm at your house. I'm returning the dream sphere. Sam, I wondered where you were today. Did I forget to lock the door again? Yeah, looks like. My mom's going to freak. That's cool though. We've got to do a study session together. All of us. So kick back and wait for us. I know Jules is ready for a turn with the sphere too. You guys are heading here now? Should be there in about 25 minutes. Got to drop off a paper to a teacher and then we're coming to my house. We'll see you there, okay? Yeah. Sounds good. Sam clicked off the call and set the sphere on Rod's coffee table. He took a breath and sat on the couch. He started to tap his fingers on his knees as he eyed the sphere. In the quiet of the house, he thought he heard the dream sphere vibrate. He picked it up and it felt warm. Or was that just his imagination? He shook his head and set the sphere back down on the table. He crossed his arms, then uncrossed them as the law of the sphere seemed to pull him in against his better judgement. He stared at Moondrop. 25 minutes. I think that's the perfect time for one last experience with you. His eyes stung and he blinked. His emotions were a little all over the place. Just once more. I don't want my last lucid dream with you to be when I lost my dad. Then he gently rubbed his eyes underneath the glasses. I want it to be good. Actually, I want it to be the best one ever. He stared at Moondrop as if the plastic figurine inside the globe could actually hear his request. Then Sam rolled his eyes. You can't really hear me though, right? He didn't set his watch. Rod and the guys would be there soon to bring him out of the dream state. He took off his glasses and set them on the table, then lay down on the couch. He switched on the dream sphere and gazed into the bright spinning lights. He started to think about school and remembered what his dad had said. You know, as you get older, I want you to experience things that are out of your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to try new things. Within the lucid dream, Sam found himself at the high school. There was a sign hanging in the hallway. 
about prom coming up. He was with Rad, and they spotted Lydia standing at her locker. Rad patted his shoulder. Go for it, Sam. Ask her to the prom. She's a really nice girl. Yeah, she's really nice. Sam shook his head. I don't know if I can do it, though. You can. Believe in yourself. But what if she says no? Rod shrugged in his casual way. Then she says no. No big deal. But what if she says yes? You'll never get to know until you try. Sam scratched his head. What's the matter? Rod asked him. I feel like there's something weird going on. Like... Like I'm missing something. I... I feel a little nervous. I usually don't feel nervous here. What? Like, like you forgot your backpack or your phone? No, my backpack is in my locker and I have my phone in my pocket. Must not be important then. But you know what is? Asking Lydia to the prom. Yeah, maybe. Sam's phone rang. When Sam pulled out his phone and checked the ID, it was his dad. He quickly answered. Dad? Is that you? Hey, Sam. Yeah, it's, it's me. I need you to come straight home after school. I have a surprise dinner planned for your mum. Surprise? What do you mean? Your mum sold her first art piece to an art dealer. We're all going out to celebrate. I'm so proud of her. She can't stop dancing around the house. Sam was confused, and then it dawned on him that in this lucid dream, the dream sphere is giving him the best experience for his last time, just as he requested. Moondrop had heard him. Maybe it's his happiest day. <laughs> not, probably not, probably not, but you never know, you never know. Um, his dad was alive in this dream. His family was together, and his mum was selling her artwork. This dream reality was how he wished his life would be. He grinned. Okay, Dad, I'll be there. This is great news. I love you. His dad laughed. I love you too, son. See you after school. Sam clicked off the call, still smiling. He looked at Rad. I'm going to ask Lydia to the prom, he said. If she says no, it'll be okay. It's not the end of the world, but at least I'll know I tried. Right. Rad smiled back. Go for it, dude. Sam confidently walked up to Lydia. She was just shutting her locker door. Oh, hey, Sam, she said with a fr friendly smile. Hi, Lydia. Uh, um, <clears throat> he cleared his throat as he felt the beginnings of anxiety claw at him. Then he took a breath and pushed the uncomfortable feelings back. I was wondering if you'd like to go to the prom with me. If you haven't been asked by someone else and if you're planning on going at all. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to go with you. Lydia's cheeks turned pink. Sure, Sam. That would be fun. I would like to go to prom with you too. Relief washed over him. Really? Uh, I, I mean, great. G uh, great. Let's exchange numbers so we can set up our plans. After he said goodbye, Sam walked back to Rad. She said yes! They slapped hands in a high five. I'm going to the prom with Lydia. He couldn't believe that he felt that he'd had the confidence to ask her and that she'd actually said yes. Way to go, bud. Knew you could do it. Sam jumped up with excitement, and he actually jumped really high as if he was floating. Sam couldn't have come up with a better description about how he was feeling. He felt so good. It... as if... as if he was floating on air. <laughs> Rod waited in the high school parking lot to meet up with the guys. The day was kind of cold, and he should have bought her a jacket. Not only that, but he felt off today. Uneasy. What's up, dude? Jules asked and slapped his hand. Bogart and Larry followed behind him. Not much, but good news. Sam's got the dream sphere back of the house. We can do a study sesh, and then it's your turn with the sphere this week. A look of annoyance flickered across Jules' face. That's cool. But look, my friend Davis works at the Mega Pizzaplex. He says they got in an awesome new arcade game, and he says we've got to try it out before the long line start. Let's head over. It'll be fun. Bogart said, I'm in. Larry said, cool. Rod scratched his chin. Well, uh, I, I told Sam, don't worry about Sam, Jules told him. He didn't even come to school today. He's not going to be up for the pizzaplex. Sam can miss out on this one time. Rod looked at the guys as they all stared at him, then gave a nod. Okay, let me text him. I'll, I'll just let him know we'll meet up with him later. He sent off a quick text to Sam, and the group took off to the mega pizzaplex. Mega Pizza Plex, here we come. <laughs> oh my god, I sound like Mario there. <laughs> Chris Pratt Mario. Uh, Bogart announced. I'm so going to conquer this new game. Sam's dream continued. He heard his phone sound in the distance with a text, but he ignored it. 
Now it was testing day and he was taking his SAT. Apparently there were many answers he didn't know. He looked around and saw other kids biting their pencils, rubbing their heads, having some trouble with the questions like he was. But this was Sam's dream and he got what he wanted. His dad's voice drifted into his mind. I want you to remember to make good and responsible choices. Be a strong young man and do what's right. But that was in real life, Sam reasoned. In his lucid dreams, he could pretty much do all he wanted without repercussions. I want you to know all the correct answers to the SAT, he whispered. Information began to download into Sam's brain. His eyes widened as he suddenly knew all the answers to the questions. He zoomed through the essay questions like a champ. He strolled up to the teacher as everyone stared at him. You've completed the entire test? Mrs. Hooligan asked with an astonished expression. Sam handed over his test materials. Yes, I have. Thank you. Then Sam strolled out of the classroom for an early lunch. He went to his locker, and when he opened the metal door, the Moondrop's dream sphere was inside. Sam jerked in surprise and quickly shut the door. How is the dream sphere here, in my lucid dream? He wondered. Why is it in my locker? His phone rang. Sam took it out and checked the screen. It was his dad again. Not now, he clicked off the call and looked around him. No one was close by, so he opened the locker again. He had an idea. You're my sphere, he whispered to Moondrop. No one else is. Let everyone else forget about you. Only I will get to use you. Moondrop's eyes flashed red. Sam smiled. He took out his lunch and shut the door, then set off toward the bleachers. When Sam got there, the guys were talking about who was the strongest in the group. It has to be me, Jules said. I'd say I'm the strongest out of everyone. We all know I'm already the fastest. Maybe, Larry said. Could be a tie between you and Rod, Bogart suggested. Rod doesn't eat more than once a day, Jules said with a laugh. I eat when I'm hungry, Rod said with a shrug. Sam sat next to Rod and leaned in to ask, Hey, whose turn is it with the sphere? Rod frowned at him. What sphere? Sam tried not to smile. Never mind. Then he shifted toward Jules. Maybe I'm as strong as you. Jules laughed long and hard. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't think I've ever heard you tell a joke before, Sam. Good one. You're really, you're finally lightening up. He shrugged. With the same height and build, could be a draw. There's no way. Jules popped a chip into his mouth and, and chewed. His stare was intense. Sam wasn't willing to back down in his own dream. Well, why don't we test it out? Ooh, this should be good, Bogart said, and he, and he adjusted his hat. Guys, take it easy. I don't want anyone to get hurt, Rod spoke up. It's all good, right, Sam? Jules said with a twist of his lips. So we'll settle this. Let's arm wrestle. Jules tossed his chip bag and sat down on, the be on a bleacher, putting his elbow on a taller row and then opened his hand. Are you scared? I'm not scared. Sam got up and sat across from Jules placing his elbow down on the bleacher and grabbed Jules' hand in a tight grip. Bogart covered their grip with his own, holding them evenly in the centre. Okay guys, let's see who's got the real muscle here. Ready? Go! Bogart released their hands and Jules immediately put all his strength against Sam's. Sam held his ground and their gripped hands struggled to stay in the middle. Yes, Jules was strong, but in Sam's dream, Jules wasn't stronger than him. They struggled back and forth for a few more moments. Then Sam adjusted his wrist and pushed with all he had against Jules', Jules arm. Jules' face turned red and his arm began to shake. Sam gritted his teeth and he shoved Jules' hand down on the bleacher and released. Sam wins! Sam's the strongest! Bogart shouted. Holy cow! What do you know? Crazy, Larry said. Sam grinned and shot his arms up in victory. Yes, I beat you! Jules scowled. I want a rematch. I had a cramp in my arm. Two out of three. Jules, come on, Rod said. Sam won. It's all good. Then a miracle happened. Jules shut his eyes, blew out a breath, and just let it go. He looked at Sam and nodded his head. You're right. It's cool, Sam. He offered his hand for a handshake. You won. Fair and square. Sam took the peace offering. And they... um. Sorry, and they shook hands. But he couldn't stop himself from getting in the last jab. Glad you accepted that I'm stronger than you. Jules scowled and Sam smiled. A phone rang again. Sam mentally pulled back from his lucid dream. Wait, he thought. Is that Rod's house phone ringing? Where are Rod and the guys? 
Shouldn't they have been at Dawson at the Dawson's house by now? Sam tried to pull himself out of the lucid dream to turn off the dream sphere, but he couldn't move. He could hear someone a few birds outside. What? What did I just say? He could hear a few birds outside Rad's house. Someone started up a lawnmower. He could even hear his own breaths. He tried to lift his hand from the couch. It wouldn't budge. This isn't funny, he said aloud in his dream. What's not funny? Dream Rad asked with him with a frown. Let me out! Sam struggled to move his entire body back onto Rad's couch, but it was like he was frozen stiff. Then something that had been bothering Sam finally bubbled up in his brain. He hadn't plugged in the dream sphere. He'd forgotten, but it had started spinning on its own anyway. How the heck was the dream sphere working by itself? Woof! Woof! Sam's eyes widened. Brutus! He yelled out with dread. Don't come near me! <laughs> He's gonna get his face chopped off. What's the matter with you, dude? Bogart asked from the bleachers. Chill out. Brutus isn't here, Rad told Sam. He's at my house. There's nothing to worry about. You're good. Wake up, Sam yelled to himself as he stood up on the bleachers and ran down as fast as he could. I actually don't remember how this ends. <laughs> like, I am I really love this story, but I, I've actually completely forgotten how it ends. I forgot the leaks. So this is going to be interesting. He started to pinch his arms. He rubbed his face and his head. He even slapped himself, trying to wake himself up. He could feel his heart pound in his chest as he started to blink really fast. Please, wake up. I won't use the dream sphere anymore. I, I, I know I was using it too much. I wasn't making good and responsible choices. I know. Please, just, just let me wake up. He felt a sharp pain on his ear. He slapped a hand there. Ow! He heard the guys call for him from the bleachers, but he ignored him. He needed to wake up from the dream state. He needed to be back in his real-life reality. A terrible pain erupted on his cheek. Ah! He grabbed at his face, but he didn't feel anything wrong with his skin. And yet, the tearing pain was there, excruciating and throbbing. Brutus! He wheezed out past the fear. He ran all the way to the school bathroom and ran into a kid exiting through the door. He shoved him aside. Watch it, jerk! The kid yelled. Sam crashed through the door, feeling unbearable pain in his neck, on his arms and his fingers. He ran to the mirror. For a moment, relief washed over him as he looked at his face. He looked fine. He looked like himself. His cheeks were red from excursion. Uh, excursion, sorry. Sweat was be uh, beaded on his forehead. His eyes were, ho were wide. I'm good. I'm all right. Then he saw Moondrop, wearing his car... Was yeah. Then he saw Moondrop, wearing his star cap, step into the reflection of the mirror from behind him. What? How? What are you doing here? Before Sam could turn to look at the jester, he felt flesh being torn from his jaw. He could hear the echoes of growling and the chomping of Brutus on his face. Wow! I I guessed the ending. I actually completely forgot this existed. Um, so, sorry for spoilers, I guess, even though I didn't. it wasn't intentional. Um, let me wake up, please! Sam screamed as he felt his nose rip off. His lips were being pulled and shredded. His teeth were gnawed on and scraped. He felt warm blood drip down his face and neck. Panic and despair crashed over him like a wave. Shaking, Sam gripped the sink harder as Brutus ate his face off back in reality. But as he stared into the mirror, nothing was visibly wrong. Sam screamed one name. Brutus! In the mirror, Moondrop had a smile on his face, half of it hidden in the shadows. The jester waved, the bell on his wrist chimed, and then Sam went very still. He let go of the sink and stood up straight. The terror disappeared. He felt completely calm and at peace. He turned and smiled at Moondrop. Everything's fine, Sam said with wide eyes. Moondrop turned to walk out the door. Sam followed Moondrop to see what new adventure they would create together. Meanwhile, on Rad's coffee table, Moondrop continued to turn, to turn gleefully in a circle, waving his hands, and then slowly stopped. Whoa, chills. I, I, I don't remember reading that in the leaks. <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't remember most of that story from the leaks. I may, I don't, I actually don't remember most of the stories, like all of them, in the leaks. So that's kind of. This is kind of a a cool thing because like I, I know what the stories consist of. I know some of the cool things in the stories, but I actually don't know the full extent of them. And that 
ending kind of surprised me because I completely forgot about the ending, really. Because I, I mainly focus on, like, the theory side of things and, like, what the law of it is, what it all means. Uh, and I can tell you right now what it means. I'm pretty sure this has got a lot to do with Remnant. <laughs> um, obviously, there are huge connections to memories in this. Um, because the, the Dream Sphere probably worked as intended. But there was clearly... Wow, something just fell in my room uh, by itself. That was weird. Uh, moon drop? Um, but no, like, the memories are big in this. And it's clear, like, the Dream Sphere was working as intended before. Like, you could see uh, you, you like, near the Pyramids of Giza. But he was using it too long. And the side effects of that are, I guess, something to do with Remnant. And it was helping with, the, like, the memories. Or it could be Agony. Like, it could be either, it could go either way. It's it's similar to Remnant and Agony and how they are connected to memories and stuff. Um, overall, I don't, I don't know what the the entirety of the story meant. Obviously, um, that's that's the reason why the Dream Sphere still worked when it wasn't plugged in. Because of um, the effect of souls or the memories that were connected to it or whatever. But this is just a really... Wow, I love this story so much. I think it's really good. Like, seriously, like, <laughs> these books are just crazy good. They are filled to the brick. Like, I don't know how Tales from the Pizza Plex is so good. I'm going to say that right now. And I thought this was the weakest story of the, of the three in this book. So really, we, we've got a big treat coming our way. Um, Just just wait until Pressure and Clethrophobia, which, um, obviously, if you're still watching, that is going to come out, hopefully tomorrow or and the or and or the day after but if not uh they should all be out by the weekend um but yeah my schedule is kind of full because i'm doing this every day including uh full-time work so um I, please make sure you subscribe and like because i've put a lot of effort into these sorts of videos um even if it's not clear at first anyway let me know what you think of this story in the comments below um, and what you think about theories and stuff, but, uh, I've been Ozone, and, uh, that was, that was Somnophobia. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you later.